Alrighty, how's it going, everyone? Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, hey, I'm super excited to be chatting with my good friend, Todd. Uh, how are you doing, Todd? I, I don't think we've been able to hang out and spend some time together in a bit, so how have things been? <laughs> oh, I'm great. I think we had to reschedule this once um, already due to some other conflicts that I had, but I'm, I'm great. Just hanging out, loving the cyber scene, you know, at work and doing what I can to upskill and just all the things. Heck yeah. I'm looking forward to diving in because uh, I wanted to spend some time to chat with you, Todd, because I think you bring a super cool perspective that a lot of folks don't exactly either know or even know exists, if that's fair to say. Uh, because it, forget, like, correct me if I'm wrong or forgive me. Uh, you came from a managed service provider, MSP, is that right? And now you're kicking it with us. So truthfully, hey, we'll, we'll let down the veil a little bit. Uh, we work together at Huntress, right? Cybersecurity vendor having a lot of fun. <laughs> Exactly. So I, I did come from that space, spent six or seven years there. I think um, a lot of people outside the MSP space, when they hear MSP, they have negative thoughts. Hmm. Um, I, so I have a couple different perspectives on MSPs being at one. It's, it's not easy and it requires people who are dynamic and can literally shift and reprioritize pretty much all day long. Um, I would love if before we dive in, I, I, I'd like to kind of get a quick crash course on your origin story, if that's okay. Like, hey, how did you fall into IT? How did you get into security? How did you sort of pivot or progress through each of those? Uh, can you give me the crash course? <laughs> sure. So um, I'm going to be taking you back a little ways. That's but all right. <laughs> probably when you were much younger, um, I was in the military. I went in as multi-channel transmission line of sight basically like RF line of sight equipment, get to my unit. They're like, yeah, we don't, we're not really using that here. You're going to do SATCOM. So I was mm -hmm. basically trained on the fly how to do perform, you know, uh, satellite communications tasks for the unit. And um, one deployment to Iraq, what a great time that was. Came home, got out of the army. I actually went back to my old job working for Spectrum, used to be charter communications. I was a broadband technician. So again, a lot of RF stuff going on there. Um, I spent most of my time doing like business trouble calls and things of that nature. And I was going to school to get into IT. Um, it was just kind of a generic, like a network engineering um, associate's degree at a local college. And then, so I was like, I need to get into like a real IT job. <laughs> and I ended up working help desk for like 18 or 24 months, Ooh. something like that. And uh, a lot of people will say that's not a great place to start either. I, I kind of disagree because it does get your foot in the door. Um, so there's people on both sides of the fence there. And I was like, you know, this help desk thing is rather boring. Uh, it wasn't, you get to a certain point where you just, you kind of go on autopilot and you can just know what to fix based on the common occurrences. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm a continuous learner. As you already know, I kind of just keep going all the time. Um, so I went from that, I was like, I need to find something else. This is getting boring. Local MSP had a job, I'd never heard of an MSP until then. Went to work doing IT support there. Uh, much different because they had ooh, like 50 different clients, I think, that they can were it, supporting when I went to work there. Can we dissect that acronym in case some folks aren't familiar? Oh, what, what the heck is an MSP and why keep saying managed yeah, service sure. provider? An, an MS an MSP is a managed service provider. And uh, in a nutshell, or the 10,000 foot view is they are a, typically a small business's IT department. So they're just outsourced IT to do all of the things. Um, so you working at an MSP, depending on the level within that you work, you have to know a lot of different technologies and how to definitely, you know, learn on the fly. And again, like I mentioned before, kind of shift priorities as things come up because there are fires. So I started doing IT support there, um, somehow worked my way into like a network engineering position. That was the title, but it was just kind of doing a lot of like tier three fixes for things that some of the other folks couldn't fix and like network infrastructure projects and stuff like that. Uh, I went from that to leading a team of the pro like the project team. And then from there was promoted to CTO of that MSP. Oh, All wow. of that happened in like seven years. So there was a lot of opportunity there that I'm super grateful to have experienced because anyone who's worked at an MSP 
can tell you that it's like at least twice as much experience on the fly as you'd get in a single organization because most larger orgs, everything is siloed off. Um, most MSPs can't operate that way because they don't typically have the people who can specialize and silo off without getting pulled into like all the other things. Um, so that is, and then getting into security, believe it or not, happened when I was at, on the MSP side of things as far as like really diving into it. Um, as you know, here at Huntress, they like to put on a hacking windows class. You've actually facilitated that a couple of times virtually. Um, I attended one in 2016 or 2017, and this is when Huntress was still in its infancy at a, it's called a, a conference called DattoCon. Datto is just one of the larger MSP vendors in the space. They put on a conference and I attended the, the Hacking Windows pre-day and I loved it. Like I was, I was hooked from then on. I'm like in that, mind you, then I was, you know, a few years younger. I'm in there like helping the people at my table better understand like how to open, like, you know, install their Kali machine, run all the things that were in the lab. And I was like, man, I really dig this. So I left from that and I just kept kind of going. Um, now I just, I perpetually chase certs and I tinker in my, my free time, which is sparingly at this point because I do have some little ones running around the house. So my, my free time is mostly dad time, which is also nice. But um, when I do get to, you know, come to my office and hide away a little bit, um, you know, I just wrapped up PNPT, I think, Nice. Two months ago, I got that cert and then took a couple of weeks off and started um, certified red team ops from zero point. Uh, and I, I sit for that exam in a few weeks, but I just keep going because uh, one thing about cybersecurity is, and I know you'll agree and anybody who tries to remain relevant in the space would agree. Probably if you're not continuously learning, like you're going to be a dinosaur and like a year, like most of what you know is irrelevant because it moves so fast. It's just, and I enjoy the technical challenges that come along with that. Oh man, you set us up great. There were so many cool things to, to unpack and chat about more in there between starting in help desk, um, between pivoting into security and that whole train of thought, like, oh man, you gotta, you gotta be with it. It's a continuous learning and certifications that we can dive into. Oh man, what... I don't know. Is there a road that you want to go down first? Uh, what's on your mind? Or, or I can totally pick one out of the hat. <laughs> I mean, I feel free to pick and we'll just roll with it. Sweet. Um, so I am super eager because if it's all right, I'd love to learn a little bit about, hey, what you're up to now. Like now that you're jumping in with Huntress, uh, it's, it's not strictly like MSP stuff that you are doing here now at a cybersecurity vendor. What are mm -hmm. you doing in the day to day? Um, and then I know you mentioned in your off time, Hey, you're chasing some certifications. Um, do those feed back towards each other in your role? Um, does the job supplement, Hey, the, the after hours and vice versa? Um, what other certifications are you going after? Hey, what, what's on the horizon after CRTO, et cetera, tons of we could get, dive into. So day to day at Huntress, um, yeah, let's start with that one. So day to day at Huntress, I spend a lot of my time working with partners and prospects, trying to help them understand like where the Huntress platform, you know, fills gaps in their current stack. Uh, it seems that a lot of MSPs, and this is probably most orgs, but I'm going to roll with MSP talk because that's what I know. They just kind of implement things because they someone said they should, but they don't really understand why or the effect that that's having or if they have overlap with some other tools. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing um, and also doing this internally. It's coined cyber therapy. So <laughs> as you know, Huntress doesn't really do incident response. Um, I think I heard someone coin it recently as more like, intrusion response because we're not an hmm. IR firm, but with what we're doing, as far as the, you know, the product goes, like we can help you identify some possible like exploit paths that were taken to get into the environment, whether that was, you know, externally, or was it phishing? Was it some other third party tool? Was it an MSPs tool that they're using for administration? Um, because that does happen. And we're able to kind of just paint the picture for them, but we're not 
we're not doing like legitimate forensics and disk imaging and you know memory dumps and going through all of that yet i, I don't know if we'll ever do that um officially but i know that we have some really awesome folks on staff at, on the research side that are way smarter than i am building out teams definitely capable of doing such now we're all learning uh but i think it's cool to use that as sort of a springboard if that's all right like and i'd love to get your take on that does it does it feel like there is sort of a glaring blemish in i guess the industry of hey uh managed service providers maybe being a prime example or other small mid-market businesses etc or just mom and pop shops right like uh, break fix mentality uh, hey, just kind of buying the next Blinky blocks because someone said that they should. Uh, not having the know-how on. I mean, we could probably talk forever on all the things when we're I don't know name dropping. Whether it's the NIST cybersecurity framework or CIS controls, those are your bread and butter. Is that fair to say? I think those are excellent starting points for any organization, especially yeah. immature ones, because the whole purpose of um, you know the NIST CSF is for organizations that don't have a proper, you know, inf information security policy, like just generally speaking, it helps you kind of build that and put it in place. Um, the sys controls are great because they kind of tell you what you need to do and provide a way to measure that based off the implementation groups. And sys controls also maps to the NIST CSF. Um, I know we're throwing a ton of acronyms <laughs> around right now. So for those of you that don't know, the NIST CSF is the NIST cybersecurity framework. It covers um, five functions at its core. I'm not going to go like dive off on the deep end of that. And then SIS controls covers like, you know, the top 18 um, items that you can cover from a security perspective with uh, 153 ish safeguards, I think across the current version. Um, definitely starting points. And it's, it's tough for smaller businesses and MSPs because it requires a lot of time. It requires time to be proactive and implementing such. And if there's anything that MSPs really struggle with, it's time. Oh yeah. It's resources in general. Um, it was, it, that, that's, it's a tough, it's tough to balance all of it, especially as a smaller MSP, because you're trying to take care of all the things for your, your, your partners as you're growing. <laughs> and then you're also trying to grow the business. So most of the smaller MSPs are like two or three people. And you have one of those two or three people doing all the things, which means they're working a lot. Um, I know I put in significant hours um, doing doing things at the MSP level, but that also provided me a, a lot of, you know, knowledge that I get to pass on to other people as perceived wisdom, I guess, but it's just me speaking from my experiences on that side of the house. I think it's super cool because it sort of bridges the gap between what in my mind are admittedly, and like, I don't know if it's weird to say, but I think the MSP world is a thing or world of its own and that speaks for not okay not strictly msp but also organizations and businesses and like real world industry companies that have a certain room for improvement in the posture mm -hmm. in, of cybersecurity and perspective and then you have sort of like the traditional and I, and I and i say that with huge air quotes of like the infosec world or the information security or strict cybersecurity. um and i think it's interesting when whenever we are talking in that information security or cybersecurity space, we, we sort of nerd out on the fun and I'll, I'll use bad words here, but like games that can help us prepare and train and be good in that fight in the real world. But it still mm -hmm. feels a little, okay. I can't say play pretend cause that's not the right encapsulation, but like, Hey, we want to do uh, war games. We want to do on the keyboard stuff to, to get more hands-on training, whether that's a try hack me, a hack the box, a PNPT, a offsec, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, it always seems like when we start to bring that into the MSP world, they're like, Whoa, <laughs> like I had no idea this was a thing. And then I, a little bit of vice versa. I don't know. It, am, am I right on that? Or what does that get you thinking? <laughs> 
I think you're spot on with that. Um, like when we do Tradecraft Tuesdays is a perfect mm. example. You'll see people in there like, I imagine what they're doing is like their jaws are dropping behind their screens because they're like, wow, I didn't know it was that easy. Context um, for some folks. Uh, Tradecraft Tuesday is just a show. It's just a webinar uh, that again, Huntress, kind of our homeboy spot, is a, that does every month on like the second Tuesday. Um, we just nerd out. We just, hey, no, no filter, uh, all candid hacking away at something wild and weird and fun. <laughs> exactly. Um, and just it's, I, so I'm on, because I have such a customer facing role, mm. right? When I, when I get to talk to people, like you can see the aha moments when you're explaining to them, like where their gaps are and how easy it really is to, you know, get into most of the environments that they're managing. Um, and it's not their, like, I don't want to say it's their fault, but you don't know what you don't know because you haven't experienced certain things yet. Um, and that's why some of the larger MSPs go into like, um, where they're really like hammering down, getting all their security aligned. They're, they're just doing everything they can from that perspective to get things rolling, to prevent that or in an attempt to prevent that next, you know, ransomware um, infection that they might end up with, because it, it's inevitable. We're all susceptible to most things that happen in, in cyberspace. So let me ask you a super hot polarizing question, if that's a okay, uh, sure. or at least one I think that we tend to talk about here and there in, in the, the communities, plural now, like, is cybersecurity the responsibility of the vendor? or the organization and company and business itself? Uh, where's the onus fall or does it in one way or the other? I don't know. Um, I think everyone has a responsibility to some degree. Okay. And I guess I'll expound on that. Yeah. So you, you have to train people in general to understand the threats that they're facing every day. I don't mean fear monger and, you know, all doom and gloom with, with all of that, but educate them, train them, not just fish them. Oh, I got you. Now go do this remedial training. Right. So, but on the other side, and when you're saying vendor and, and organization, are you referring to like security vendor and org or like outsourced it as an MSP and org just so that. I kind of know where to take it. So, so I guess, yes, <laughs> I guess, I guess both, honestly, because <laughs> like product ABC or organization or company that provides something, uh, can you rely all the time on like, oh, oh, my antivirus product will take care of that for me. Or, oh, my EDR, XDR buzzword will, will, I don't have to worry about security. I've, I've heard people say the onus is on the vendor to take care of you because it's a service, it's a product, it's what you're paying for. I've also heard people say like, no, the onus is on the user. It's on the people, it's on the company or the, the organization being serviced. I th like, I kind of side with you. It's a little bit of both. Uh, and everyone is sort of in this fight together. Um, yeah. <laughs> it it kind of goes to not putting all your eggs in one basket. That's mm. why you there's multiple layers to the whole cybersecurity thing. You know, you're going to have your firewalls for your your local networks. You're going to have email security to try to, you know, block out those phishing attempts. You're going to have endpoint protection. All AVs can be bypassed. Let's just say it. Like it's a thing. They can all be circumvented. Um and then you have some security vendors who will um, it's, it's kind of one of the things when I think back to when I was working on the MSP side of things is a lot of vendors will overstate the capabilities of their products challenge. I say to anyone who's at MSP or, or otherwise watching this challenge, the claims that are made. If a product says it can do X, Y, and Z challenge those claims that I'm just going to leave it there. I've done, independent testing on my own prior to coming to Huntress. So I don't want to name drop because then it looks like, oh, I'm biased because I work at Huntress. Um, but just challenge the claims, however you think is necessary. Can I ask, what do you think is a good, or if there is like an example or like a tactical way of doing that? Like, 
company chest thumps and says, oh, oh, we could have stopped solar winds or whatever. You'd be like, okay, how? Like, can you show me? Can, can, what, what, what would have been done, et cetera? I don't know. How do you ask that or how do you hold them accountable? So oftentimes when you ask that question back to a vendor that would make such a claim, um, and I'm whipped. trying not to laugh because there's a one in particular that I'm thinking of. It's they'll always say, well, if you checked all of these boxes, boxes, exactly how we tell you, then we could have prevented this. However, there should be a huge, a huge asterisk with that is how does having that policy in place affect the usability within the environment for the users? Because you're trying to balance the user experience with security. So if I'm locking down a machine completely, it can't do anything and they have to call me every time something needs to be done, like an Adobe update or any, uh, let's just call it like, you know, a Chrome update or whatever, like that updates, it feels like a couple of times a week, maybe. Like just imagine if you're an MSP, we'll we'll just say 10,000 devices Hmm. and you're running such an application across all 10,000. You really want those phone calls? And those incoming tickets, not to mention the liability that comes with using such a product that says, we'll stop everything. Well, that's going to give some people this, this like false sense of security that they're going to go resell to their partners. It's going to stop all the things. And then the next thing you know, it's getting circumvented or it's drivers are getting unloaded with something like backstab. Like it, they got to just you got to be mindful how how you're marketing those things because there are also legal ramifications for for what you say and do Mm. i think one thing a lot of people don't think about is their websites right and i'm not i'm just going to use msps as an example because again that's the world that i know mostly you'll go to their websites professionals experts you'll see all these these buzzwords this can be used against you i was at a show um in Chicago, I don't remember you know which show it was for work. There was a lawyer there speaking, and he was talking about things like that. And like you're you're putting forward this public persona of being an expert, yet you disabled MFA so a vendor could you like more easily use an application, and then that's a path into exploit. Mm. Like I've had that conversation with with someone. Uh, again, no names, but disabled MFA to make it easy on a vendor to access devices within a specific organization. A vendor was sharing those credentials internally. And then that, that MSP's partner was pop. Like, and then again, also having um, a complete understanding of the tools that you're using. So there's, there's a remote access tool that's used in conjunction with the RMM. There's an integration with them. They're from the same company. However, you can log into the the remote access tool independently of the RMM. RMM login had multi-factor authentication. Direct logins to the remote access tool did not. Guess what happened? A couple of clients got popped. So you gotta understand the tools that you're putting in place. So that's just an extremely long-winded way of saying it's, it's on everybody. You need to understand the true capabilities of what the vendor's product is. And you need to understand the usability from your side so you know how to protect it. And that's a lot to do for an MSP. Like, let's take it back to their world, 50, 60, 100 environments. How in the world do they manage all of that efficiently when they run very lean in most of them? Um, I, I don't know how they do it. And that's why they're such a target. Oh yeah. Not to say that they're not, there aren't some that are great at what they do. They just, they can't keep up with everything. If Fortune 500 companies can't keep up with everything, there's zero chance that an MSP is from a security perspective. A lot of other really cool things to, to pick apart in that one. Cause I, I, I think kind of what you were alluding to is like, Oh, the implications of using something in some way, somehow, uh, I know that, you know, you were mentioning, Hey, 
MFA, multi-factor authentication, still being, oh, e e weighing the security versus convenience in getting something done, whether it's for however long of time, um, especially when you're rolling out a product or buying the new plinky box fat, flashy thing. Uh, the other big one that sticks out of my mind is like, hey, antivirus exceptions, like, oh, we need to be able to get some updater to come through and roll through in whatever way, add an exclusion for uh, this folder or whatever and like oh it turns out the folder was the entire c drive like <laughs> uh, uh <laughs> i've seen some pretty cringeworthy documentation <laughs> from vendors where it's like oh just um exclude c program files i can't imagine what would go wrong from there <laughs> like it's it's pretty bad and i think it's also on us as consumers in general just to push back on shady practices like that like fix your product make your product more secure because we all know at this point um the risk involved with using such an exclusion mm -hmm. see you know program files what could go wrong you know like it's it's a sad state of affairs in some cases but um i guess in the same token some people kind of see it as a way like, well, nobody's making me do it. So do I really need these things? And then now you have insurance companies, like cyber insurance companies going nuts and um, increasing prices because they didn't really understand what they were insuring or mm. how to protect or how the people they're insuring should be protecting the assets of those organizations. It, it's just a long list of just a lot, of, no one being on the same page. And, and I really don't want to see government intervention because, let's face it, they don't do everything well. So I, I have never touched the whole conversation of uh, cyber insurance on this channel, but I would love to kind of, if it's all right, pick your brain. And, uh, what What is cyber insurance? Because I think you might be the better person to be able to explain or talk through that. And then are there fallacies are there blemishes are there incredible successes i don't know i mean honestly i'd i'd personally rather steer clear of that topic oh, fair enough <laughs> yeah because i am they, Dangerous there are waters people for both of way, us yeah there are people way more educated in that than i am um the only thing i've ever really had to do as far as cyber insurance goes is the questionnaires that they would send mm. are you using mfa do you have an edr it's just a checklist. And most of the time they don't validate what you put on there unless there's a claim. Um, then it becomes a whole different issue. But as far as uh, it's just a way, you know, at the end of the day for a, a business to ensure their, their operability, if that makes sense yeah. to recover from any sort of downtime or lost revenue due to a, a real cyber incident um, in a nutshell. But as far as diving into the weeds, like I'm, Definitely not the guy for that. Same here. <laughs> I do think I've heard a trend in that when something hits the fan or like when there's whatever intrusion or bad B word or incidents, sometimes it's a scramble to now either already have the contacts uh, for your insurance and then knowing what is covered, like actually knowing the quote to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. but again, Hey, I'm, I'm by no means an authority on that. So I don't mean to speculate. Uh, the only thing I'll throw in on, on the tail end of that mm. is, um, companies need to make sure that they have a solid incident response plan. Yeah. Is that extremely rare in your eyes? <laughs> oh, from what I see? Yes. Uh, a lot of times it's some cyber incident happens and they're like, we're going to call hunters. <laughs> We don't do incident response in that fashion, but we do have some things that can help people, you know, kind of formulate an IR plan, at least at a 10,000 foot view of contacts. What, you know, which internal personnel are a part of that response team? What are their roles and responsibilities for when a cyber incident kicks off somewhere? Knowing just those few things is helpful. And then obviously all of the point of contacts for the partners, um, legal, cyber insurance, et cetera. It's just trying to figure that out in the moment is the worst time to figure it out. I'm giving a presentation later on at some other future event and we're focusing on a little bit of that just as well. Um, just that preparation, right? Um, and we're t I'm tying it towards that 
in this cybersecurity framework, not to keep beating a dead horse, but the Mm -hmm. first pedestal on that is just identify. And I'll be the first to admit it is the most boring, like, I don't know, drudge worthy uh, portion of building your, your cybersecurity posture, but it is like the most vital and fundamental. Like, look, can you give me a network map? Can you literally tell me what endpoint is here and there and how and why? Um, and if I were to like, I, I wonder, cause I don't want to do like the cringy, like, Oh, can everyone in the room raise their hand for me? But it's like, right. is it going to be abysmal if I were to even ask that question? <laughs> um, pr- probably. Yeah. It, it, if I don't know, we can talk offline where you're going, Oh, for sure. but it, it, I'm, it's an MSP event. If it's for Huntress <laughs> or is it, or is it the, what, what are you doing for, um, Wild West Hacking Fest. Ooh, yeah. Thanks so much for asking. So uh, this, this was very, very cool emerging of worlds, right? So when I went to Ride of Boom, uh, which was an event held over in that managed service provider community, uh, the Cyber mm-hmm. Call, Cyber Nation, that was Andrew Morgan's baby. Incredible fella. Um, he had been able to make some moves. And hey, we, we got John Strand over from Black Hills Information Security to come party with us. Uh, I've had a cool conversation with him on this YouTube channel just as well. If anyone wants to go hang out with that. Um, but John Strand puts out an in- fascinating and lovely and incredible conference, uh, Wild West Hacking Fest. Um, and while we were at Rite of Boom together, he had asked... and this was like the most like flattering and I, I, I'm so honored thing because it was surreal. He said like, Hey, would John, would you be willing to be a keynote uh, speaker over at Wild West Hacking Fest? And I'm like over the moon. Uh, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Dude, without a doubt. Uh, so now very, very recently, I think just last or this week, as we were spending some time to record this, Todd and I, we were able to announce it's totally out in public. Like, yay, Hey, John's going to be uh, one of the keynote speakers at Wild West Hacking Fest. Um, so sorry, extreme background context. What I would like to do is probably play off a little bit of the, uh, you might've seen an old silly video that I had. It was the hard truths and unexpected realities, uh, lamentations Mm -hmm. of being in cybersecurity. Uh, And I I have a certain amount of dread and like a certain amount of anxiety in that because part of me being a nerd, being a geek, it's like, oh, I want to put out a technical talk. I want to be slinging code. I want to be throwing out really cool elite uh, cyber warrior ninja stuff. But I think, and I'm trying to trying to convince myself for a keynote, like, hey, maybe it's appropriate to take a high level approach and just like, let's survey the industry, our people, our personnel, um, and the community. Um, so I'd like to probably pull on the thread of hard truths and unexpected realities, but I won't give any of the secrets away just yet. <laughs> nice. Um, <clears throat> so back to the identifying what you yeah, have yeah. part of, you know, the, the NIST CSF. Uh, so I, I do agree hundred percent is the most vital part because if you don't know what you have, how do you know what to employ to protect it? Hmm. Um, and that's kind of how we, we can kind of go back to the one comment that I made about implementing things because someone said you should do it, but you don't really know why, or if it's something you truly need or your partner client truly needs. Um, so identifying the things that you're protecting and that, that's the, that is the most important part because then you know kind of how to navigate from there or it's much easier to navigate because you have a better understanding of the environments. Uh, and it's not easy and it is not sexy at all. Like there's, you're not doing anything that is going to, you know, I guess give you that dopamine hit of any type because it's, it's a lot of administrative stuff. Like the majority of it is, is administrative um, tasks, but getting those in place early. So for anybody who's at a smaller MSP or smaller company who can affect change, understand that now is the best time for you to take action to start implementing these because if you have to do it retroactively, so once you grow and you gotta go back and try to retroactively create all of this, it's gonna be extremely overwhelming ask me how I know because you just because you can't do all the things you accrue what most people in the industry would term technical debt well you also accrue administrative debt 
because you're not keeping up with the changes in the environments like you should. A lot of it's not documented like it should. So again, how do you know what to protect if you don't even know what's there? Hmm. It's not easy. Like MSPs have a very hard job and I'm very sympathetic to what they do. And um, it's, it's a lot of people. It's easy for a lot of people from outside the industry, the MSP industry specifically to like, you know, kind of be negative toward it or whatnot, but that's why we exist. Like we're trying to elevate their game. And I don't know what we do when that happens. And I say when trying to be optimistic, but hopefully it does because then we'll just continue to grow what we do um, to continue to benefit those folks. Super cool. Yeah. I think, I don't know there, I think there are a lot of uh, good pithy statements that we, I don't know, r- land on uh, appropriately, but, and I, I know we keep saying MSP and keep mentioning this, but I, I, I think this expands to a whole larger broad audience of like any, organization might have the very same faults, the very same issues. Um, mm-hmm. and it's, there's no exception over at the top. Right. So, uh, we, we keep saying some cheesy thing like, Oh, security for the 99%. It's like the, the economy, <laughs> like the whole world might right. have room for improvement. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, they do look at, what was it? Colonial pipeline last year mm. where it was like stale VPN creds or something that <laughs> got initial access to the environment and allowed that to, to happen. Like it's, so this is where I tend to go in a lot of my talks. I'll, I'll yeah. end up on a soapbox for a brief moment and it goes back to the fundamentals. You can buy whatever tool you want, whatever like new shiny tool that you see that you want. that They tell you it's going to fix all your problems. It's not. If you're neglecting the fundamentals, something as simple as user account auditing. And if I recall correctly, in that specific instance, that user didn't even work there anymore and still had an active account. So it's like, where's the, um, like the, the employee offboarding document on the IT side of things to disable that account, right? Or the auditing side of things to review like account last logins. Because if you have accounts that haven't logged in in months, odds are they probably don't work there anymore. So auditing, MFA, like just all the, there's so many simple things that can protect organizations. Like we know lack of MFA and phishing are like the two primary methods right now uh, in most instances. And it's like (laughs) every, everybody should force MFA, but that's just what I think from a security perspective. It takes, it takes me two seconds to either push, you know, approve on my push notification from whatever app it might be or maybe a couple more seconds to type in a six digit pin. Like it's, it's not a big deal. Um, the, the fundamentals really, really matter. And I, I want to say, I heard John Strand say this like years ago, and it's just something that really stuck with me was, you know, good security starts with exceptional system administration or something along those lines. Mm. And that's true. And that also, you can tie that right back to identify, like you have to know what you're working with. So you know how to protect it. And I think that's where there's a lot of failures because people want to do all the cool, sexy things and they forget about all the other things that could be impactful or, or just, or have just as much as an impact as those, those cool things, if you will, because even I get caught up in that, right? Like my day to day is not very challenging, which is from a technical perspective which is why I tend to tinker in my spare time with chasing certs, if you will. Um, And yeah, it's just, you got to know what you're protecting so you can protect it. So I I think it'd be cool to sprinkle in a little bit of the, our uh, offensive and red teaming and pen testy and then OCTF stuff that, that we still like to tend to do um, and how we sort of bridge it again for quote unquote real security. And I'm using seriously humongous air quotes on that. But I think there's one cool pithy thing we could also sort of break down or I would love to get your thoughts on. It's like between everything that you've done, between PNPT, cruising through CRTO, when you're rocking through some, some war games and some offensive on the keyboard stuff, there is one thing that people say uh 
and I, I'm curious what you tend to think or, or if we can shift it or bend it in one way. When, when the world says, oh, the, it, it's a losing game because the adversary, the adversary only has to be right once when the defense has to be right 10,000 times or whatever. I'm sure you know. What, I'm sure you, you've heard that, right? I, I've heard, yeah, something What do you similar. think? <laughs> um, frankly, I, I think that is in. So I, I disagree with that because, again, let's go back to layers, right? Uh, as a and let's just take pen testing as an example here. When you're pen testing and you get your initial ex, like you're in the environment, first thing you're going to do is what? Start enumerating. What does enumerating do? It makes noise. Now, are the defender's tools um, configured in a way to hear that noise, to catch that in the early phases? We're ne- defenders will never be right 100% or of the time. So, as and I, I want to say that I read this in the CRTO, and it was a really good point, is, you know, we talk about defense in depth. Well, pen testers and red teamers and threat actors have offense in depth. Like, when they get in your environment, they're going to start looking around. What's here? Like, how can I move? What's the next move, et cetera? And they're equipped to handle different situations. But you, on the defending side of things, you you have to, again, this falls back to knowing what you're defending. Um, and, and it's hard for some people because when you get into red teaming and like threat profiling and things like that, it gets very specific as far as like how those engagements are carried out. Whereas with pen testing, you pretty much have a scope. And as long as you don't go outside of it, anything's free game. Um, we know what, so this is where like a miter comes into play, mm. I think in a big way across the tactics and techniques, knowing what the most common things are, because let's just be real here. Not everyone's being targeted by nation states that are doing just off the wall, crazy things to get into and remain persistent in environments. I mean, so you did the baby shark thing for, for hunters. Like you did some of that research and investigation start. There were, there were footholds there. That's one of the most common te- techniques that are used for persistence. It's just a scheduled task foothold. Like, so it, it all comes down to defending in a way that you know, for what is most common, let's say, hitting that 80% mark, Mm. right? Um, That's probably not that expensive from like a financial perspective or a spend point for uh, a company. But going from 80 to 85 might cost you what it costs to go from zero to 80 and and even more expensive moving forward. So how what are you trying to solve for, I guess, is really what it comes down to. Um, And then that kind of circles into like how much security is enough and you'll often hear good enough security is enough. And that's really just, you know, what the most common things are protect all of those areas first, and then start to grow, um, you know, your safeguards and protections beyond that. If the, the organization can afford it, but it's not always necessary to catch things in the early stages. Yeah. I, uh, I know, I know I think... that was extremely long winded, no. but <laughs> Um, it, it really comes down to, so just really having your, your defensive tools tuned to hear the noise that attackers are making, because they're always beating on the door. Like if you're not monitoring for failed login attempts and someone's brute forcing you, that's a fail for that. That's, that's, that's a strike for a defender. Um, if you're not monitoring like other windows events that are spawned from you know, just running simple things like net user, net group. Um, that's a fail. Even new user creation. You should probably monitor for that because threat actors love to create new users. Like there's, and my favorite thing for that is the, um, I'll send you the link so you can yeah. link it if you're comfortable doing it. But uh, what is like the ultimate guide to Windows security encyclopedia or something like that? Um, that goes through like all of the Windows security events. Oh, Most wow. tools can easily monitor window security events. It's not difficult. Um, but yeah, you, you got to, again, you got to know the environment. I think it's super cool because I, 
like without a doubt, I think there are a handful of aspiring uh, red teamers and pen testers that will listen in and kind of watch some of this content and open uh, some bug bounty fellows and some CTF players and folks that lean more towards that offensive side for threat emulation. And I think there might still very well be some of the blue teamers and some defense and some and some responders mm-hmm. and malware analysts that, that watch and keep up with this sort of thing just as well. So I think it's kind of neat to level the playing field in that sort of way when we hear you keep saying, oh, the adversary only needs to be right once. Uh, well, let's twist that because, you know, once they get initial access, once the threat actor is in, they're on your home turf. Like you have the home field advantage and you could go so far as to say, hey, the defender only needs to be right once. Uh, so maybe that's a cool nugget. I don't know for anyone listening. <laughs> no, like that's a really good way to put it. Like you just need to have one layer somewhere that's going to catch the noise and you have to be monitoring for that noise in some capacity um, to be able to, you know, investigate and determine whether or not that was a threat or an event, if you will, but it's layers. That's, that's such, and that is so cliche to say, but that is really what it comes down to. Each of those layers is an opportunity to catch a threat actor if you are paying attention. I've had to express that a lot. I feel like whenever I have talk tracks, right? I always feel like I know I'm saying like the stupidest, like most boring, lame, bare bone basics and like, oh, cybersecurity hygiene. But like, that's it. That that, we need to keep saying it because no one's doing it. (laughs) Well, and that's why, like that's why we keep saying it. You can go to any show um, especially a show that's put on by like vendors of, in the security space. And they always tie things back to, at the end of the day, it's some fundamental or security hygiene, um, you know, whether that's device hardening or MFA, et cetera. Like it's oftentimes it's just the simplest things that get people. And it's just for whatever reason, like I, I can, we could speculate all, all afternoon about, you know, what those reasons are. But for, for whatever reason, they're just, they overlook something that's fundamental and it uh, becomes a thorn in their side when it's leveraged in a cyber incident. Heck yeah, man. Well, hey, I know we've been bantering for a little bit. I know we've been chatting for a while. Um, anything else on your mind or we can start to wind this thing down, my friend? What, uh, where can folks find you if anyone else, hey, wants to keep touch, uh, see what Todd is up to? Are you out and about on the interwebs these days? <laughs> I am a little bit. I spend most of my time um, on LinkedIn. Nice. Um, and that's just at slash Todd A. Painter, P-A-I-N-T-E-R, for those that didn't catch it. Um, I do have a YouTube channel. It's called Tap Cybersecurity. I only have a couple videos up. Um, one was like me getting on a soapbox of a little bit, but I did provide a bunch of good learning resources for um, you know people getting into the industry who are trying to just figure things out and i did go on a little bit of a rant but that's okay and um the second video that i put out was my review of uh tcm securities practical network penetration tester nice exam which was fun um uh, meant that's pretty much it like i am on twitter but twitter for me is just uh, that's that's just intel for me like i just have <laughs> curated lists and I have a Discord bot that dumps things into like my private Discord server nice. to keep me out of the apps and away from all the all the drama that social media likes to bring. That's a good thing to that, that would be a cool thing to showcase or chat about is like oh oh the building your own uh, Intel feed or, or or threat notice advisory thing uh, for your own home shop so you don't have to deal with the stuff happening on the social media (laughs) yeah i think florian roth i just seen him share like his cybersecurity list um i didn't get a chance to look at it yet but i plan to i'm sure that i have many of the same same folks on my little curated list but it's just it's intel for me mostly awesome well hey this has been awesome my friend i think it is very very cool because obviously we spend a whole lot of time on in the in the training ground that we're in right hey hacking away at boxes and popping shells Mm -hmm. and trying to understand these things uh but when you bring it to the another level of like no what does it look like in the world and in the industry uh, um it's not all 
you know, slinging zero days and vulnerabilities around that there's the other side of that. There is a defense, there is a protection. Um, and we need to do a little bit better sometimes. So, uh, very, very cool. Very, very sobering. And thanks so much for spending some time to, to hang out with me, Todd. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add, most of us aren't worth someone wasting a zero day. So keep that in mind. Oh yeah. You don't need to, it's hard to plan for the things that you don't know exist. Um, and anyone that says they're going to stop a zero day, uh, I question their integrity. <laughs> it's a wild world that we live in, my friend. <laughs> it is. Cool. Great hanging out, John. Thanks so much. Take care.